Chapter 6 of Henry D. Thoreau. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Smith. Early Essays in Authorship by Franklin Benjamin Sanborn. It has been a common delusion, not yet quite faded away, that the chief transcendentalists were but echoes of each other, that Emerson imitated Carlyle, Thoreau and Alcott imitated Emerson, and so on to the end of the chapter. No doubt that the atmosphere of each of these men affected the others, nor that they shared a common impulse communicated by what Matthew Arnold likes to call the zeitgeist, the ever-felt spirit of the time. In the most admirable of the group, who is called by preeminence the sage of Concord, the poet Emerson, there has been an outbreathing inspiration as profound as that of the zeitgeist himself, so that even Hawthorne, the least susceptible of men, found himself affected, as he says, after living for three years within the subtle influence of an intellect like Emerson's. But, in fact, Thoreau brought to his intellectual tasks an originality as marked as Emerson's, if not so brilliant and star-like, a patience far greater than his, and a proud independence that makes him the most solitary of modern thinkers. I have been struck by these qualities in reading his yet unknown first essays in authorship, the juvenile papers he wrote while in college, from the age of seventeen to that of twenty, before Emerson had published anything except his first little volume, Nature. And while Thoreau, like other young men, was reading Johnson and Goldsmith, Addison, and the earlier English classics, from Milton backwards to Chaucer. Let me therefore quote from these papers, carefully preserved by him, with their dates, and sometimes with the marks of the rhetorical professor on their margins. Along with these may be cited some of his earlier verses, in which a sentiment more purely human and almost amatory appears than in the later and colder, if higher, flights of his song. The earliest writings of Thoreau, placed in my hands by his literary executor, Mr. Harrison Blake of Worcester, are the first of his Cambridge essays, technically called Themes and Forensics. These began several years before his daily journals were kept, namely in 1834, and it is curious that one of them, dated January 17, 1835, but written in 1834, recommends keeping a private journal or record of our thoughts, feelings, studies, and daily experience. This is precisely what Thoreau did from 1837 till his death, and it may be interesting to see what reasons the boy of seventeen advanced for the practice. He says, As those pieces which the painter sketches for his own amusement in his leisure hours are often superior to his most elaborate productions, so it is that ideas often suggest themselves to us spontaneously, as it were, far surpassing in beauty those which arise in the mind upon applying ourselves to any particular subject. Hence, could a machine be invented, which would instantaneously arrange upon paper each idea as it occurs to us, without any exertion on our part? How extremely useful would it be considered? The relation between this and the practice of keeping a journal is obvious. If each one would employ a certain portion of each day in looking back upon the time which has passed, and in writing down his thoughts and feelings, in reckoning up his daily gains, that he may be able to detect whatever false coins may have crept into his coffers, and, as it were, in settling accounts with his mind. Not only would his daily experience be greatly increased, since his feelings and ideas would thus be more clearly defined, but he would be ready to turn over a new leaf, having carefully perused the preceding one, and would not continue to glance carelessly over the same page, without being able to distinguish it from a new one. This is ingenious, quaint, and mercantile bespeaking the hereditary bent of his family to trade and orderly accounts. But what follows in the same essay is more to the purpose, as striking the keynote of Thoreau's whole afterlife. He adds, Most of us are apt to neglect the study of our own characters, thoughts, and feelings, and, for the purpose of forming our own minds, look to others who should merely be considered 
as different editions of the same great work. To be sure, it would be well for us to examine the various copies that we might detect any errors, yet it would be foolish for one to borrow a work which he possessed himself, but had not perused. The earliest record of the day's observations, which I find, is dated a few months later than this, April 20th, 1835, when Henry Thoreau was not quite 18, and relates to the beauties of nature. The first passage describes a Sunday prospect from the garret window of his father's house, afterwards the residence of Mr. William Monroe, the benefactor of the Concord Library, on the main street of the village. He writes, "'Twas always my delight to monopolise the little Gothic window which overlooked the kitchen garden, particularly of a Sabbath afternoon, when all around was quiet and nature herself was taking her afternoon nap, when the last peal of the bell in the neighbouring steeple, swinging slow with sullen roar, had left the vale to solitude and me, and the very air scarcely dared breathe, lest it should disturb the universal calm. Then did I use, with eyes upturned, to gaze upon the clouds, and, allowing my imagination to wander, search for flaws in their rich drapery, that I might get a peep at that world beyond, which they seem intended to veil from our view. Now is my attention engaged by a truant hawk, as, like a messenger from those ethereal regions, he issues from the bosom of a cloud, and, at first a mere speck in the distance, comes circling onward, exploring every seeming creek, and rounding every jutting precipice. And now, his mission ended, what can be more majestic than his stately flight, as he wheels around some towering pine, enveloped in a cloud of smaller birds, that have united to expel him from their premises. The second passage, under the same date, seems to describe earlier and repeated visits made by his elder brother John and himself to a hill which was always a favourite resort of Thoreau's, Fairhaven Cliffs, overlooking the river bay, known as Fairhaven, a mile or two up the river from Concord Village towards Sudbury. In the freshness of the dawn, my brother and I were ready to enjoy a stroll to a certain cliff, distant a mile or more, where we were wont to climb to the highest peak, and seating ourselves on some rocky platform, catch the first ray of the morning sun, as it gleamed upon the smooth, still river, wandering in sullen silence far below. The approach to the precipice is by no means calculated to prepare one for the glorious denouement at hand. After following for some time a delightful path that winds through the woods, occasionally crossing a rippling brook, and not forgetting to visit a sylvan dell, whose solitude is made audible by the unwearied tinkling of a crystal spring, you suddenly emerge from the trees upon a flat and mossy rock, which forms the summit of a beetling crag. The feelings which come over one on first beholding this freak of nature are indescribable. The giddy height, the iron-bound rock, the boundless horizon open around, and the beautiful river at your feet, with its green and sloping banks, fringed with trees and shrubs of every description, are calculated to excite in the beholder emotions of no common occurrence, to inspire him with noble and sublime emotions. The eye wanders over the broad and seemingly compact surface of the slumbering forest on the opposite side of the stream, and catches an occasional glimpse of a little farmhouse resting in a green hollow and lapped in the bosom of plenty while a gentle swell of the river, a rustic and fortunately rather old-looking bridge on the right, with the cloud-like watcher set in the distance, give a finish and beauty to the landscape that is rarely to be met with even in our own fair land. This interesting spot, if we may believe tradition, was the favourite haunt of the red man, before the axe of his pale-faced visitor had laid low its loftier honours, or his strong water had wasted the energies of the race. Here we have a touch of fine writing, natural in a boy who read Irving and Goldsmith, and exaggerating a little the dimensions of the rocks and rills of which he wrote, but how smooth the flow of description, how well placed the words, how sure and keen the eye of the young observer. 
To this mount of vision did Thoreau and his friends constantly resort in after years, and it was on the plateau beneath that Mr. Alcott, in 1843, was about to cut down the woods and build his paradise, when a less inviting fate, as he thought, beckoned his English friend Lane and himself to Fruitlands in the distant town of Harvard. At some point after this, perhaps while Thoreau was encamped at Walden with his books and his flute, Mr. Emerson sent him the following note, which gives us now a glimpse into that Arcadia. Will you not come up to the cliff this p.m. at any hour convenient to you, where our ladies will be greatly gratified to see you, and, the more they say, if you will bring your flute for the echo's sake, though now the wind blows? R. W. E. Monday, one o'clock p.m. It does not appear that Thoreau wrote verses at this time, though he was a great reader of the best poetry, of Milton very early, and with constant admiration and quotation. Thus, in a college essay of 1835 on simplicity of style, he has this passage concerning the Bible and Milton. The most sublime and noblest precepts may be conveyed in a plain and simple strain, the scriptures afford abundant proof of this. What images can be more natural, what sentiments of greater weight, and at the same time more noble and exalted than those with which they abound? They possess no local or relative ornament which may be lost in a translation. Clothed in whatever dress, they still retain their peculiar beauties. Here is simplicity itself. Everyone allows this, everyone admires it, yet how few attain to it. The union of wisdom and simplicity is plainly hinted at in the following lines of Milton. Suspicion sleeps at wisdom's gate, and to simplicity resigns her charge. Early in 1837, Thoreau wrote an elaborate paper, though of no great length, on Milton's L'Allegro and Il Penseroso, with many quotations, in course of which he said, these poems place Milton in an entirely new and extremely pleasing light to the reader, who was previously familiar with him as the author of Paradise Lost alone. If before he venerated, he may now admire and love him. The immortal Milton seems for a space to have put on mortality, to have snatched a moment from the weightier cares of heaven and hell, to wander for a while among the sons of men. I have dwelt upon the poet's beauties, and not so much as glanced at his blemishes. A pleasing image, or a fine sentiment, loses none of its charms, though Burton, or Beaumont, and Fletcher, or Marlowe, or Sir Walter Raleigh, may have written something very similar, or even in another connection, may have used the identical word, whose aptness we so much admire. That always appeared to me a contemptible kind of criticism which deliberately and in cold blood can dissect the sublimest passage and take pleasure in the detection of slight verbal incongruities. When applied to Milton, it is little better than sacrilege. The moral view taken by the young collegian in these essays is quite as interesting as the literary opinions or the ease of his style. In September 1835, discussing punishments, he says, Certainty is more effectual than severity of punishment. No man will deliberately cut his own fingers. Some have asked, cannot reward be substituted for punishment? Is hope a less powerful incentive to action than fear? When a political pharmacopoeia has the command of both ingredients, wherefore employ the bitter instead of the sweet? This reasoning is absurd. Does a man deserve to be rewarded for refraining from murder? Is the greatest virtue merely negative? Or does it rather consist in the performance of a thousand everyday duties hidden from the eye of the world? In an essay on the effect of storytelling, written in 1836, he says, The story of the world never ceases to interest. The child enchanted by the melodies of Mother Goose, the scholar pondering the tale of Troy Divine, and the historian breathing the atmosphere of past ages, all manifest the same passion, are alike the creatures of curiosity. The same passion for the novel, somewhat modified to be sure, 
that is manifested in our early days leads us in afterlife when the sprightliness and credulity of youth have given way to the reserve and scepticism of manhood to the more serious though scarcely less wonderful annals of the world the love of stories and of story-telling cherishes a purity of heart a frankness and candour of disposition a respect for what is generous and elevated a contempt for what is mean and dishonourable and tends to multiply merry companions and never-failing friends in march eighteen thirty seven in an essay on the source of our feelings of the sublime thoreau says the emotion excited by the sublime is the most unearthly and godlike we mortals experience it depends for the peculiar strength with which it takes hold on and occupies the mind upon a principle which lies at the foundation of that worship which we pay to the creator himself and is fear the foundation of that worship is fear the ruling principle of our religion is it not rather the mother of superstition yes that principle which prompts us to pay an involuntary homage to the infinite the incomprehensible the sublime forms the very basis of our religion it is a principle implanted in us by our maker a part of our very selves we cannot eradicate it we cannot resist it fear may be overcome death may be despised but the infinite the sublime seize upon the soul and disarm it we may overlook them or rather fall short of them we may pass them by but so sure as we meet them face to face we yield speaking of national characteristics he says it is not a little curious to observe how man the boasted lord of creation is the slave of a name a mere sound how much mischief of those magical words north south east and west caused could we rest satisfied with one mighty all-embracing west leaving the other three cardinal points to the old world methinks we should not have cause for so much apprehension about the preservation of the union this was written in february eighteen thirty seven before he had reached the age of nineteen he thus declared his independence of foreign opinion while asserting its general sway over american literature in eighteen thirty six we are as it were but colonies true we have declared our independence and gained our liberty but we have dissolved only the political bands which connected us with great britain though we have rejected her tea she still supplies us with food for the mind the aspirant to fame must breathe the atmosphere of foreign parts and learn to talk about things which the homebred student never dreamed of if he would have his talents appreciated or his opinion regarded by his countrymen ours are authors of the day they bid fair to outlive their works they are too fashionable to write for posterity true there are some amongst us who can contemplate the babbling brook without in imagination polluting its waters with a mill-wheel but even they are prone to sing of skylarks and nightingales perched on hedges to the neglect of the homely robin redbreast and the straggling rail fences of their own native land so early did he take this position from which he never varied in may eighteen thirty seven we find another note in his opening life in an essay on paley's common reasons he says man does not wantonly rend the meanest tie that binds him to his fellows he would not stand aloof even in his prejudices did not the stern demands of truth require it he is ready enough to float with the tide and when he does stem the current of popular opinion sincerity at least must nerve his arm he has not only the burden of proof but that of reproof to support we may call him a fanatic an enthusiast but these are titles of honour they signify the devotion and entire surrendering of himself to his cause so far as my experience goes man never seriously maintained an objectionable principle doctrine or theory error never had a sincere defender her disciples were never enthusiasts this is strong language i confess but i do not rashly make use of it we are told that to err is human but i would rather call it inhuman if i may use the word in this sense i speak not of those errors that have to do with facts and occurrences but rather errors of judgment 
Here we have that bold generalization and that calm love of paradox which mark his later style. The lofty imagination was always his too, as where this youth of nineteen says in the same essay, Mystery is yet afar off. It is but a cloud in the distance, whose shadow, as it flits across the landscape, gives a pleasing variety to the scene. But as the perfect day approaches, its morning light discovers the dark and straggling clouds, which at first skirted the horizon, assembling as at a signal, and, as they expand and multiply, rolling slowly onwards to the zenith, till, at last, the whole heavens, if we accept a faint glimmering in the east, are overshadowed. What a confident and flowing movement of thought is here, like the prose of Milton or Jeremy Taylor, but with a more restrained energy. Duty, writes the young moralist in another essay of 1837, is one and invariable. It requires no impossibilities, nor can it ever be disregarded with impunity so far as it exists, it is binding. And, if all duties are binding, so as on no account to be neglected, how can one bind stronger than another? None but the highest minds can attain to moral excellence. With by far the greater part of mankind, religion is a habit, or rather, habit is religion. However paradoxical it may seem, it appears to me that to reject religion is the first step towards moral excellence. At least no man ever attained to the highest degree of the latter by any other road. Could infidels live double the number of years allotted to other mortals, they would become patterns of excellence. So too of all true poets. They would neglect the beautiful for the true. I suspect that Thoreau's first poems date from the year 1836 or 37, since the Big Red Journal in which they were copied was begun in October 1837. The verses entitled To the Maiden in the East were by no means among the first which date from 1836 or earlier, but near these in time was that poem called Sympathy, which was the first of his writings to appear in Mr. Emerson's Dial. These last were addressed, we are told, to Ellen Sewell, with whom, the legend says, both Henry and John Thoreau were in love. Few of these poems show any imitation of Mr. Emerson, whose own verses at that time were mostly unpublished, though he sometimes read them in private to his friends. But like most of Thoreau's verses, these indicate a close familiarity with the Elizabethan literature and what directly followed it in the time of the Stuarts. The measure of sympathy was that of Davenant's Gondibert, which Thoreau, almost alone in his contemporaries, had read. The thought was above Davenant, and ranged with Raleigh and Spencer. These verses will not soon be forgotten. Lately, alas, I knew a gentle boy, whose features all were cast in virtue's mould, as one she had designed for beauty's toy, but after manned him for her own stronghold. Say not that Caesar was victorious, with toil and strife, who stormed the house of fame. In other sense, this youth was glorious, himself a kingdom wheresoever he came. Eternity may not the chance repeat, but I must tread my single way alone, in sad remembrance that we once did meet, and know that bliss irrevocably gone. The spheres henceforth my elegy shall sing, for elegy has other subject none. Each strain of music in my ears shall ring, knell of departure from that other one. Is it then too late the damage to repair? Distance, forsooth, from my weak grass path reft, the empty husk, and clutch the useless tear, but in my hands the wheaten kernel left. If I but love that virtue which he is, though it be scented in the morning air, Still shall we be dearest acquaintances, nor mortals know a sympathy more rare. The other poem seems to have been written later than the separation of which that one so loftily speaks, and it vibrates with a tenderer chord than sympathy. It begins, Lo, in the eastern sky is set thy glancing eye. And then it goes on with the picture of lover-like things, the thrushes and the flowers, until he says, 
the trees are welcome waved and lakes their margin laved when thy free mind to my retreat did wind then comes the persian dialect of high love it was a summer eve the air did gently heave while yet a low-hung cloud thy eastern skies did shroud the lightning silent gleam startling my drowsy dream seemed like the flash under thy dark eyelash i'll be thy mercury thou cytherea to me distinguished by thy face the earth shall learn my place as near beneath thy light will i outwear the night with mingled ray leading the westward way let us said her face, break up the tiresome roof of heaven into new forms and with as bold a flight did this young poet pass to his stellar duties then dropping to the conquered meadow again like the tuneful lark he chose a less celestial path of gentle slope and wide as thou wert by my side i'll walk with gentle pace and choose the smoothest place and carefully dip the oar and shun the winding shore and gently steer my boat where water lilies float and cardinal flowers stand in their sylvan bowers a frivolous question has sometimes been raised whether the young thoreau knew what love was like the sicilian shepherd who found him a native of the rocks a lion's whelp with his poet nature he early gathered this experience and passed on praising afterwards the lion's nature in the universal god implacable is love foes may be bought or teased from their hostile intent but he goes unappeased who is on kindness bent there's nothing in the world i know that can escape from love for every depth it goes below and every height above the red journal of five hundred and ninety six long pages in which the early verses occur was the first collection of thoreau's systematic diarizing it ran on from october eighteen thirty seven to june eighteen forty and was succeeded by another journal of three hundred and ninety six pages which was finished early in eighteen forty one he wrote his first lecture on society in march eighteen thirty eight and read it before the concord lyceum in the freemasons hall april eleventh eighteen thirty eight in the december following he wrote a memorable essay on sound and silence and in february eighteen forty wrote his first printed paper of consequence as he says on aulus perseus flaccus the best of the early verses seem to have been written between eighteen thirty six and forty one his contributions to the dial which he helped edit were taken from his journals and ran through nearly every number from july eighteen forty to april eighteen forty four when that magazine ceased for these papers he received nothing but the thanks of emerson and the praise of a few readers miss elizabeth peabody in february eighteen forty three wrote to thoreau that the regular income of the dial does not pay the cost of its printing and paper yet there are readers enough to support it if they would only subscribe and they will subscribe if they are convinced that only by doing so can they secure its continuance they did not subscribe and in the spring of eighteen forty four it came to an end in eighteen forty two thoreau took a walk to wachesett his nearest mountain and the journal of this excursion was printed in the boston miscellany of eighteen forty three in it occurred the verses written at least as early as eighteen forty one in which he addresses the mountains of his horizon monadnock wachesett and the peterborough hills of new hampshire these verses were for some time in the hands of margaret fuller for publication in the dial if she saw fit but she returned them with the following characteristic letter the first addressed by her to thoreau concord eighteenth october eighteen forty one i do not find the poem on the mountains improved by mere compression though it might be by fusion and glow its merits to me are a noble recognition of nature two or three manly thoughts and in one place a plaintive music 
The image of the ships does not please me originally. It illustrates the greater by the less, and affects me as when Byron compares the light on Jura to that of the dark eye of woman. I cannot define my position here, and a large class of readers would differ from me. As the poet goes on to unhone primeval timber, for knees so stiff, for masts so limber, he seems to chase an image already rather forced into conceits. Yet, now that I have some knowledge of the man, it seems there is no objection I could make to his lines, with the exception of such offences against taste as the lines about the humours of the eye, as to which we are already agreed, which I would not make to himself. He is healthful, rare, of open eye, ready hand, and noble scope. He sets no limits to his life, nor to the invasions of nature. He is not willfully pragmatical, cautious, ascetic, or fantastical. But he is as yet a somewhat bare hill, which the warm gales of spring have not visited. Thought lies too detached. Truth is seen too much in detail. We can number and mark the substances embedded in the rock. Thus his verses are startling as much as stern. The thought does not excuse its conscious existence by letting us see its relation with life. There is a want of fluent music. Yet what could a companion do at present, unless to tame the guardian of the Alps too early, leave him at peace amid his native snows? He is friendly, he will find the generous office that shall educate him. It is not a soil for the citron and the rose, but for the hortleberry, the pine, or the heather. The unfolding of affections, a wider and deeper human experience, the harmonizing influences of other natures, will mould the man and melt his verse. He will seek thought less and find knowledge the more. I can have no advice or criticism for a person so sincere, but if I give my impression of him, I will say, he says too constantly of nature, she is mine, she is not yours till you have been more hers. Seek the lotus, and take a draught of rapture. Say not so confidently, all places, all occasions are alike. This will never come true, till you have found it false. I do not know that I have more to say now. Perhaps these words will say nothing to you. If intercourse should continue, perhaps a bridge may be made between two minds so widely apart. For I apprehended you in spirit, and you did not seem to mistake me so widely as most of your kind do. If you should find yourself inclined to write to me, as you thought you might, I dare say many thoughts would be suggested to me, many have already, by seeing you from day to day. Will you finish the poem in your own way, and send it for the dial? Leave out, and seem to milk the sky. The image is too low. Mr. Emerson thought so too. Farewell. May truth be irradiated by beauty. Let me know whether you go to the lonely hut, author footnote number eight, the Hollowell place, no doubt. And write to me about Shakespeare, if you read him there. I have many thoughts about him, which I have never yet been led to express. Margaret F. The penciled paper Mr. E. put into my hands, I have taken the liberty to copy it. You expressed one day my own opinion that the moment such a crisis is past, we may speak of it. There is no need of artificial delicacy, of secrecy. It keeps its own secrets. It cannot be made false. Thus you will not be sorry that I have seen the paper. Will you not send me some other records of the good week? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. This searching criticism would not offend Thoreau, nor yet the plainness with which the same tongue told the faults of a prose paper, perhaps the service, which Margaret rejected in this note. Concord, 1st of December, 1841. I am to blame for so long detaining your manuscript, but my thoughts have been so engaged that I have not found a suitable hour to re-read it as I wished till last night. This second reading only confirms my impression from the first. The essay is rich in thoughts, and I should be pained not to meet it again. But then, the thoughts seem to me so out of their natural order that I cannot read it through without pain. I never once feel myself in a stream of thought, but seem to hear the grating of tools on the mosaic. It is true, as Mr. Emerson says, that essays not to be compared with this have found their way into the dial, 
but then these are more unassuming in their tone and have an air of quiet good breeding which induces us to permit their presence yours is so rugged that it ought to be commanding these were the years of thoreau's apprenticeship in literature and many were the tasks and mortifications he must endure before he became a master of the writer's art End of chapter 6 Recording by Mark Smith